Hey, this is Jason Hartman, and greetings from beautiful Portofino, Italy, episode 2014. You know, the last time I was here, I was 22 years old, and this was just a little fishing village that maybe wasn't that discovered, well, not maybe, but it definitely wasn't that discovered back then, and now it seems like it's been discovered because this is touristville <laughs> i mean it is so crowded here i can't believe it but of course our cruise ship just let off and we're on this gorgeous celebrity cruise i gotta say out of the 20 or so cruises i've taken they really do a nice job the ships are gorgeous this particular ship the edge was a one billion dollar ship completed and delivered just before COVID. So a lot of these ships, just like the river cruise I was on last week, you know, were completed right before COVID and, and then they basically were not used for a couple of years. So when you say how old are they, you almost have to really subtract two years from the age of the ship, right? <laughs> anyway, little thing there. But what I want to tell you, you know, this is kind of interesting and instructive about real estate being in Portofino again, because when I was here originally, 22 years old at the time, I couldn't believe how beautiful this is. I wanted to come here because I actually heard about Portofino on a audio cassette tape. Yes, a cassette tape. For those of you millennials and Gen Zers, ask your parents what that is. <laughs> and Earl Nightingale, the great mentor that I had many years ago, he was talking about Portofino in one of his tapes. And I thought, wow, I just got to go there. And so uh, on my first trip to Europe as an adult, as many of you know, I was born here. But as my first trip as an adult, I came with a friend and we drove here to Portofino and I just couldn't believe how beautiful this this little fishing village was and now it has become a, just a major tourist attraction. Uh, so I'll just show you a little bit of this and then we will get to uh, today's full episode. One of the things that really surprised me here when I first came, and I don't know if you can notice it in the back if you're watching me on video, the shutters that you see on the buildings, most of them aren't real, they're just paint. They're just painted on. <laughs> so, uh, so that kind of uh, uh, freaked me out the first time. I didn't realize that, uh, but this is just a gorgeous place. And what was that lesson? Oh, let me get back to that lesson. The lesson is that this, again, you look at the enduring power of real estate and really income property specifically. This was just a little fishing village, a largely undiscovered place for forever. And then at some point it got kind of discovered and it has become a tourist mecca. It's a very small town. And now the price of real estate, the staying in real estate, uh, we were talking to the waiter at the last restaurant or the last cafe, and he said, staying in these apartments that you're seeing me pointing at that are above the cafes, you know, a couple thousand euros a week for that easily. And of course that's very seasonal and you know, what does the waiter know, right? He doesn't rent them. But the price has just skyrocketed of this little fishing village that nobody ever thought about before. And that's what happens with income property. You know, there's a great old uh, real estate book called Buy and Hold. And I can't remember of the, the late author's name offhand, but he was investing in Redondo Beach, California. And I mean, think of it. Imagine if we were investing in a place like Redondo Beach, and at the time we thought it was a linear market, like the places we invest in now, some of our Florida markets, some of our Alabama markets, Tennessee, Texas, Arkansas markets, right? Those change over time. You know, they get kind of discovered. And we definitely know we have a housing shortage that will likely last decades because of these incredibly cheap mortgages. Again, 25% of the country has a mortgage at or below 3%. 65% of the country has a mortgage at or below 4%. And they aren't selling anytime soon. Now, a lot of people have speculated on the real estate crash that they think is coming. And you know me, I think they are very wrong about that. The chicken little sky is falling, doom and bloomers usually are wrong, but they tend to get a lot of clicks. They tend to sell a lot of books because uh, everybody wants to hear the bad news, right? So what are the things that could disrupt this whole low inventory problem in the years to come? Well, here's one of them. If they repeal the due on sale clause, 
if somehow by an act of Congress and maybe the Supreme Court, I don't know who would have to do this, but I, I think it might be both because Congress enacted the due on sale clause, but then the Supreme Court upheld it when it was challenged. And I think that was about 1978 or so. And so that could change everything. If the due on sale clause went away and people could sell their properties and they could sell them and allow the new buyer to assume the mortgage, that would change everything. A lot of inventory would come to the market. I haven't heard anybody ever talking about that. It's completely my idea. So, you know, it, it's probably a crazy idea that will never ever happen. So that's one thing that could happen. The other thing that could happen to disrupt our low inventory problem that is likely to continue for many decades to come, the other thing that could happen is we could just have massively low rates again. What if we move into another COVID era? What if we move into a time where uh, the Fed is just not worried about inflation? Uh, then we could potentially, I mean, it'd be extremely, uh, extremely rare and amazing, but we could potentially see very low interest rates again, making the existing mortgages with the super low rates not that special. And people would sell their properties because they wouldn't mind trading their 3% mortgage for another 3% mortgage on another home. But what does that mean? That means we'd like be likely to have a whole bunch of inflation. And with a whole bunch of inflation, that means we would be likely to have a whole bunch of inflation-induced debt destruction. So it's something to think about. Either way, if you play your cards right as a good income property investor, you will win the game. It'll either be a cash flow market and a yield market, or it will be a capital gains and capital appreciation market. Either way, you are going to win. And that's why you are investing in the most historically proven asset class in the history of the world, income property. It is my pleasure to welcome my friend Manny Kim with Giza Capital onto the show to talk about something that is usually used in the world of Wall Street and the stock market, but we're going to apply it to income property, which I think is the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. And this is none other than the Sharp Ratio by William mm. F. Sharp, who won a Nobel Prize in economics back in 1990. And Manny has some great insights for us. Welcome back, Manny. How are you? I'm doing great, Jason. How are you? Good, thanks. So tell us about the Sharp Ratio and how or even why it should apply to income property and not just stocks. Well, I think that's a great way to frame the question because you have to remember whenever you talk about quantitative finance or quants, uh, we just use mathematical tools. So just like you can use a hammer for many different purposes, you can use a sharp ratio for pretty much anything in the world, in fact, that has a price on it, right? So the key with the sharp ratio is that it's really the first time in mathematics, right, where the idea of a reward to the variability of that reward has been linked into one single formula. So before William Sharp, this is a little bit of history will help actually. So before William Sharp, the only mathematical model, so to speak, that was widely known was the discounted cash flow model by John Burr Williams in the 1930s. So really what William Sharp, this is the first time, and this is why he won the Nobel Prize, is that this is the first time where mathematics from a statistical standpoint was used to measure investment performance. So that's why this is such an important idea and concept. Now, there are flaws with it, and we're going to go into that, but we're going to look at the definition of what it is and then how that applies to real estate and how that compares to stocks so that we can really measure apples to apples, uh, which one is a better investment according to this definition. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So the sharp ratio is basically you're measuring the excess return of a portfolio or an asset or an asset class above the what's called the standard deviation of that return. So if we go back to high school, right, and you go to high school statistics, I'm sure most of your audience has learned about the normal distribution, right, the bell curve, right? We've heard about this before. So just uh, doing a quick recap, standard deviation is basically the square root of the variance of the data 
across the mean. So the greater the standard deviation of a investment and its return, that means that there's just more volatility with that investment return. Does that make sense to you guys? Yep. So the greater the standard deviation around the same mean, that means that for the same amount of return that you're trying to get, right? You have to endure more volatility. And that's what the sharp ratio with a single number calculates. And that's why it's so uh, useful. But the key here is that the assumptions is that the variance, so the actual fluctuation around the average return has to be stable if you're going to use this to um, predict future returns. So that's a very big assumption, right? The second assumption is that the distribution of the actual returns of your investment or portfolio is a bell curve. It can't be some weird um, statistical distribution, right? That's unusual. And of course, you have to have enough data. Um, if not, you can't calculate stable statistics. So I want to go through a theoretical illustration to show you why this is such an important concept, right? So let's say you have asset one and two, they make both 15% returns yearly on average, right, for 10 years, but asset two has three times the level of volatility. So yeah, they make the same return at the end of 10 years. One, um, So asset one, uh, if you start with 100, it goes to 250. As a two, you start with 100 bucks, it goes to 250. Same return, right? At the end of 10 years. But because the volatility of asset two is three times that of asset one, the sharp ratio is much lower. So this is what the sharp ratio goes underneath the asset to measure, not just the return or how good the asset could be, but okay, how good is it relative to the volatility you have to take, right? So that's a key insight that uh, William Sharp uh, brought to us, right, with his work. Now, this is the more interesting uh, example, right? So let's say you have two assets, right? Asset one uh, makes 15% every year for 10 years. And asset two actually makes half the return. So if you're just looking at the returns, right, you're going to be like, oh, I should do asset one because it just makes more money, right? It makes double the return over the same mm -hmm. amount of time. But if you look at the actual volatility underneath that for asset one and asset two, in this example, asset two has one third the volatility of asset one. So, huh, so how do I really make a comparison then, right? In terms of which one will give me more return per unit of volatility. So when you actually calculate the sharp ratio for these two assets, asset two is a better investment according to sharp ratio. So in this case, what you would do is let's say you want to match the return of asset one, right? With asset two, which is half the return. You would just lever up asset two to match the return and get still the less volatility, right? If you lever up asset two, I think the volatility level is 3.3%. 3 so you'll still get less volatility at 6.7 and make the same return. So that's why asset two is a better asset. And in this case, asset two would be something like real estate, right? It has less volatility than the stock market and it has less return, but it has a better sharp ratio. So when you lever it up, you actually get a better risk adjusted return. So that's why sharp ratios are used and um, that's the insight that sharp ratios give. Okay. So, so they're pros to using it. So it makes you, uh, allows you to make apples to apples comparisons. Yeah. Yeah. What were you saying? Uh, well, what I was saying is, uh, yeah. you, you know, it's like the old saying in the investment world, right? Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Yes. And you have to measure the returns and the volatility from whatever asset it is from the past. And, you do, yes. You know, it, it may be less volatile in the future or more volatile. So, of course, that'll skew it. But the return may also be different in the future, of course. So that's interesting. But I think no one really could argue that real estate is less volatile than stocks because it's less liquid. And what I always say is liquidity creates volatility. When you can trade an asset at the click of a mouse versus yeah. having to go through a lengthy process of getting the property listed and conducting showings and negotiating offers, right? That's a much slower process. Yes. It's much less liquid. So it is less volatile for that reason, among others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, it's interesting you mentioned the backwards looking issue. That's a big issue when you use sharp ratios. So one thing that we could go into uh, when we have more time is looking at how sharp ratios change based on macroeconomic data, 
right? So what's the correlation between, let's say it's a high inflationary period, which one does better versus that? And if we're entering into different types of macro environments or interest rate environments, you can quantitatively show like what's the relationship between those two things. So just because it's backward looking does not necessarily mean that it's, um, some people would say it is useless uh, in the quantitative finance world, but uh, not necessarily. You can draw uh, good conclusions that are quite stable. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah, so these are like the um, so these are pros and the cons of uh, using the sharp ratio. But the key is that it makes it allows you to make apples to apples comparisons between probably very different asset classes. Even like you can use to value insurance. What is the uh, sharp ratio of an insurance policy? So this really gives you like a nice number that you can look at to see. Oh, this would be better versus this one uh, in a nice quick can way. Okay. Yeah. So now we're actually going to calculate the sharp ratio for stock market and also the median home price, which would be proxy to income property, right? So what's really important is uh, whenever you make a calculation in quant world, in quantitative finance, you need to be very precise in terms of what your assumptions are, which data set you're getting and the numbers that you're putting in. So I'm just laying out like what the model is going to calculate. Right. And that's very important to do. So I just wanted to make that also available to your audience. So if your audience wants to um, do this analysis on their own, they can also do that with the same uh, parameters. So the risk free rate, I'm going to assume it's 3% to proxy, let's say, a one year treasury uh, on average in the last like, 50 years or so and or inflation. Right. If that's your uh, benchmark. So the risk free rate in sharp ratio land is usually measuring like a benchmark rate that people um, assume is stable. So that's uh, the metric there. And uh, we're doing quarterly calculations on a rolling basis. So every quarter we're calculating the returns and it's about a 52 year data set from the 1970s. So it's a pretty decent, it's a pretty uh, good data set to use. So now when we calculate the sharp ratio of the stock market, um, I think, you know, Stock market is 9% on average, right, on a yearly basis. And the volatility is like 15.7%. So that's like on any 70% uh, of the years that you are in the stock market, like you can expect the return to be plus 15%-ish and minus 15%-ish from 9%. That's what that means, right? So it's very volatile, right? And the sharp ratio is pretty low as a result of that, right? Now, the graph that you see on the right is actually calculating the sharp ratio on a five-year basis. So in so the statistics that I just gave you, the sharp ratio being 0.38, that's looking at all 50 years, right? So just looking at this asset as a whole through different environments, different macro environments, different decades, economic environments, like overall, like what is the sharp ratio? So if I put $1, like how reliable is a dollar in giving me a return? It's 0.38. Right. But what's interesting is when you look at the sharp ratio every five years, right, and you roll that calculation every five years, you see that there are cycles to how um, good the stock market is. Right. So I think the peak was in uh, 2000, right, for the sharp ratio. It's above a two. And there was another peak in 2016. So you can see that there are cycles to how good an investment could be. And we'll also see that with real estate in the next slide. So what's cool about real estate is that the sharp ratio is actually higher by a lot percentage wise, right? So stock market is 0.38, but median homes in the United States over the same time period was 0.52. So you almost get double the sharp ratio, right? With, uh, with income property. So that means that if you put $1 into real estate versus income property, like the reliability of the 6% return that you get on real estate is almost double that of the stock market for the same level of return, which is pretty interesting, right? When you look at the chart of median home prices and their actual rolling sharp ratios that we did before, like in the stock market, on average, it's just higher. You can see it uh, pretty clearly in the chart. And you can see in the 70s, the sharp ratio was the highest, right? That would explain the outperformance of real estate in the inflationary period. And also the lowest part of that chart is the great financial crisis. So starting in, I think, 20, 2008, uh, late 2008, all the way up to mid-2014, the sharp ratio was extremely negative. So that means that during that time period, if you put money into real estate, right, um, the prices, so we're just calculating prices here, mm -hmm. kept going down relative to the money you put in. 
So the chart really shows that, right? In terms of how good, quote unquote, the investment is according to the Sharpe ratio. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. So now we can put these two charts together and actually compare the Sharpe ratios. So um, every five years, so we're looking back every five years and every quarter we're calculating the Sharpe ratio, looking back every five years, look how much higher during the nineties, the stock market is compared to real estate. And I'm sure, you know, you've um, probably experienced this or some of your listeners have definitely experienced that phenomenon, right? Stocks being so hyped up in the nineties, right? With the dot com and all that stuff. And that shows in the chart, right? The sharp, the sharp ratio, um, during that time period is much higher than real estate. But in a lot of other periods, uh, real estate was also higher than stock. So you can see it graphically using this um, risk-adjusted return measurement, which assets outperform during which periods, which is very cool to see. Manny, thank you very much for explaining the sharp ratio. That is something that nobody ever talks about with real estate investments. So it's good to use that. I always think it's great to go outside of one's field and learn from what they're doing in other fields like the Wall Street world. So that's mm. really great. It's great to have an understanding of sharp ratio. And what surprised me is that, yeah. uh, you know, something that has a lower return actually yeah. might be the better investment, at least according to the sharp ratio. So sure, um, yeah. yeah, very interesting to yeah. know. Anyway, thanks again for sharing this and give out your website. Uh, my website is GizaCapital.com and you can uh, reach me there. Excellent. Excellent.